I'd like to introduce a, a wonderful colleague of mine, Philippe Moraine, a basic scientist also in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He uh, studies sleep and is interested in the synaptic changes that occur uh, on neurons in the brain um, in relation to different medical conditions and sleep. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, today I would like to talk about imaging and our attempt to understand the complexity of the brain connections. So, as you know, imaging is wonderful to capture, you know, nature, beauty, and here, sometimes, happiness. Um, but when it comes to today's talks, you know, nobody will deny the fact that imaging has been critical to revolutionize medicine, the way we diagnose, the way we treat. Nobody would think now to go to an hospital or whatever and just say, no, I'm not going to have a radiography, ultrasound, or CT scan, or fMRI, if it's relevant. This has changed the way we work. The problem is, when it comes to the brain, the brain is the most complex part of your body. There is more complexity in your brain than in everything else. What I mean by that, there is, let's give or take, 200 billion neurons in your brain. And they are just not like floating neurons, you know, like, like this. It's just organized in this deep, connected, uh, highly uh, dense, you know, forest or jungle. And what makes them talk to each other are synapses, you know, those connections. And I would like you to think of them as nanoprocessors. They are the ones that will encode your memories, stabilize them, retrieve them. They are the ones that will allow you to think. Okay, so your mind is not floating, it comes from your brain and your synapses. So, and this failure at the synapse, or those failures at the synapse, are primary causes of many psychiatric and neurological conditions. So if you want to cure them, you need to understand them, and you need to go down there. Well, the problem, oh sorry, is that with 200 billion neurons, you deal with 200 trillions of synapses. When have you ever in your lifetime dealt with such numbers? You know, it just never in general. Well, in the lab we have to, but it's is a thing. So it's basically trying to understand 200,000, uh, 200, 2,000, it's already enough, uh, galaxies. But at the system level, with knowing exactly what every single star does. This is what we're dealing with. So how do you do that? Well, we don't, okay? But there are some good news. How do you deal with 10 to the power 14 elements? So when it comes to the synapse, we're lucky because they share structural components, proteins encoded by the genome. So, and the way synapse connect and talk to each other are through chemicals that are, you know, uh, proteins or molecules that are, you know, uh, modulated by those proteins. So now we know with immunostaining and different fluorescent uh, uh, tricks how to just give a wavelength to each one of those proteins. And the good thing is that it allows you to track synapses, and not only synapses, but synapses compartment, presynaptic, postsynaptic, in between, so you can have a very high resolution of what those synapses are. And with this, actually, you can classify them. So when you combine immunostaining fluorescence some high resolution photography or imaging, and of course, AV computation, I don't have the time to talk about it today. You get this. You create, and this is an, you know, a piece of brain where every single synapse has been captured. There is nothing missing here. You've got all the synapse of this cortex, of this piece of cortex. Every color corresponds to a category of synapses. You can, you remember yesterday when Tom and Amit were like, the problem in psychiatry today is about measurement, diagnosis, treatment. You can count them. You can calculate their volume. You know the concentration of protein within a single synapse. You have actual measure, measure in the physics sense of it, okay? So the thing you could say, okay, it's pretty, you know, it's a bunch of physicists and biologists fooling around, as always. Uh, but we actually applied it to a real case, you know, to fragile X syndrome. So fragile X is a disease that um, children have, and they have an autistic-like uh, phenotype. And 
they are fit, they are very aggressive behaviors as well. It's very difficult for the parents. And it's the most common cause of inherited intellectual disability. So it's a very important disease to look at. So what we did, and it's a little bit dense here, but it's kind of easy. So on the left, you see this um, chunk of uh, brain where we capture all the synapses, okay? We recorded or we captured more than one million individual synapses. The blue bars, imagine that it's like 20 classes of synapses. They all go towards the fragile syndrome, meaning they are going to the knockout kind of side. The thing is that knowing what defects are allowed us to pick the drugs that can normalize them. And for example, in this case, you can see we applied uh, m 5 antagonist, whatever. But you see those red bars pushing those synapses toward a normal state, okay? What is interesting as well, you see that some of them doesn't respond to the drug. And it's really important for several reasons. It's important because this technique allows you to find the defects, see how the treatment affects the defects. Actually, it allows you to combine drugs to know, you know, you restore this part of the synaptic deficiency, but you can bring another drug to combine with it to get a higher level of restoration. The behavior, by the way, is also, you know, saved in this case. What is really interesting as well, is just we found that it was explaining the failure of clinical trials that have way too high expectations. So we see that actually those drugs work, but you need to combine them to have a greater uh, signal. What was really important as well, because I don't show you, you know, the extents of the drugs that we, you can dismiss drugs. In psychiatry often we give drugs without exactly knowing what it will do to the brain. You don't want to do that. So you want to help the provider to eliminate drugs that would be detrimental to your synaptic connectivity, right? And of course, you know, you can use it, oh, sorry. Um, to identify and characterize new drugs. And because it was quite successful, John Merck and Frax have pushed us to continue. And more recently, Sfari, the Simons Foundation, wants us to do exactly the same for autism, with the idea that not about the genetics, but the common synaptic defect will be found in the different cases of autism spectrum disorders. So not only is this high fidelity proteomic imaging works well at the synapse, but if it works at the synapse at the subcellular compartment of the cell, it can work for anything else. You're at the nano, my, uh, a nanoscopic level. And here it's a pretty image just to show you that you can capture the diversity of the brain. It's not only, only neurons, it's glial cells, it's endothelial cells. It's also all the elements that are around it. This is another example, again, it's pretty, because you see those nice tubular structures, which are basically myelin sheets around the axons. Myelin has those very fatty structures that gives the whitish uh, aspect to white matter, gray matter. Of course, the brain is not a two-compartment kind of thing. There are molecules behind it. You know, I'm mo mentioning mostly you know, proteins, but of course, lipids are critical. And this, for example, allows you to see important elements that are failing in multiple sclerosis, for example, and other pathologies. If it works at the synapse and other elements, you can see any kind of pathology, actually. And here, I'm showing you human amyloid plaques destroying, basically, the synapses. So the staining will be removed for the plaques. And you see that the synapses that were in this environment and around are destroyed by those plaques. Okay? So it allows you to track this kind of neurodegenerative process. And because it was really working well, we've been approached by your um, colleagues in oncology to say, of course, if it, if it works on, on your process, can it work in cancerous tissue? And in fact, it does. And it's really important because in this era where immunotherapy is working so well, remember the way we define our synapses is by characterizing, giving them an identity with protein. You want the same thing with cancer cells. You want to be able to uh, distinguish them from the healthy cells around. So once you have this, you can pick up the antibodies that will target the tumor. So this was a very good trick as well. So what's next for us? Of course, now the uh, technology actually is mature enough to be brought to, uh, to the industry. It could be like in the main line of the pathology. You know, it's just in any lab, you have a biopsy. You characterize it at the finest level to know what's going on. Of course, in drug research, 
And in our case, you know, as scientists, of course, we want to continue to understand, maybe not to tackle this trillion of synapses, but, you know, to have a good glimpse of it. And because synapses are, are at the heart of all, you know, mind and, and most diseases that goes with it, you can apply it to fragilex, autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and of course, cancers. And in our case, because we work on sleep and aging, one of the things is to understand the function of sleep at the synapse and how it changes, um, you know, as we age. I guess I'm over time, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much.